See No Evil, a DC Entropy audio drama by Wolf Beaumont, Episode 1, starring Thomas Cadillac Panter as Alan Scott, Noel McCann as Captain Jim Corrigan, Aubrey Poppleton as Hannibal Hawks, and Harley Cumberly as Madame Xanadu. For as long as I can remember, I dream the same dream every night, my mind whispering forgotten thoughts. As always, it begins with a boy caught in a storm of dust, a great field of sand carved into an epic scape of hills and vales, soon lost to the howling haze surrounding him. The boy, dressed in little more than a sarong and head wrap, guides a horse by the reins, Ahead of a small wooden chariot, the beast neighs in fright, its eyes continually seared by the grim winds. Easy, Saba. The boy's muffled voice calls out, the horse resisting his urge. He peers at the ground in the murky light again, trying to find something. Can't have gotten far. Somewhere in the desert storm, a sound reaches his ears, and in his worry, it can only be a faint cry for help. The boy bolts forward, dragging Saba along, ascending the precarious dune ridge. After a while, the wind begins to let up, and the horse catches sight of the drop on either side of their dangerous path, rearing backwards in sudden fright. Caught unprepared, the boy tumbles backwards, the reins jolting from his hands, throwing him down the ridge's mountainous slope. Eyes shut tight, he tries to hold his breath. Every toss slams him against the ridge's side, air bursting from his lungs again and again until at long last he reaches the bottom, barely able to breathe, half buried under an avalanche of sand. His prone figure slips in and out of consciousness, and in the distance, Saba neighs once more before a quiet silence settles on the desert, the wind ebbing into a quiet breeze. The boy lies there, his raw skin bleeding from the rough abrasions incurred against the hard patches of sand on his descent, until after what seems to be an endless dream, a soft sound of footsteps approaches. Barely able to open his eyes, he catches sight of the figure, muttering a single word before passing out again. Uh, Shayara.
darkness. Shadows. A girl's laughter. Caught in the silhouette of a gas lamp as two bodies merge in a moment of intimacy, hidden behind the cobbled alley's corner. The woman inhales sharply, a shadow brought to a silent halt, the silhouettes descending into the dark recesses beneath the gaslight's contours. Rash lovers, I think, <laughs> chuckling ever so slightly. I notice my legs moving unsteadily as I attempt to light a cigarette. As usual, I had entirely too much to drink, but with Alan out of town, drowning my sorrows had become a typical pastime of late. I mean, one of the chorus melodies from tonight's opera, Sapphiros Demonium. My match strikes a flame, and I light the cigarette. The opening night had undoubtedly been a roaring success. I'd already booked a booth for Alan and I when he returned. He'd be thrilled. A gasp carries down the alley as I stumble towards the lovers, no doubt realizing they're about to be disturbed. Shadows flicker once again across the alley wall. Don't be shy on my account, I laugh, <laughs> turning the corner. Each to their own. My words die. My voice gurgling into silence. Wet blood washes down my front, soaking my finest garments. It takes a seemingly everlasting moment for the white hot pain of having my throat slit to register. I collapse against the wall, clasping at my throat desperately, choking as the blood begins to fill my lungs. Eyes bulging. I look around as a scream rings out. There's a girl lying on the dark ground, a pretty little thing beneath a shadowy mass skulking over her, working a knife along her naked torso. The girl screams again, the shadow attempting to gag her once more. I stare in horror, my limbs cold and tingling. Without the strength to rise and vanquish this evil fiend. Helpless, I watch the butcher work, my eyes tied to the girls, tears coursing down each of our faces, our lives coming to a tragic close, until at last my eyes glaze over and darkness and dark swallows me, swallows me, swallows me. All, 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 all. I screamed, awakening with such force that Morgana flew the bed in fright, hissing retribution. Sweat poured down my skin, drenching the sheets. I turned away from the crackling fireplace, only to catch my reflection in the mirror, and palpable relief gossed through me. I was still me, still that young girl Nimu. We had played in the forests and meadows with their sisters, countless millennia ago. Time had stolen some of that youth, but I still saw her behind the jaded eyes of Madame Zanadou, as I styled myself these days. The events of the nightmare returned to me suddenly, and I realized it could only have been one thing, either a portent or a vision. If it was the former, I still had time. Morgana jumped into my lap with a loud purr. Come, my sweet, I must consult the cards. Pulling them from my nightstand, I laid out the tarot cards in a pentagram and muttered an ancient incantation, the words long forgotten by mortal tongues. Turning each card over, I watched the story unfold, only to gasp anew with the final card read. A powerful demon. Unquenchable thirst. Madness. Greed. Something lost, now returned. A light in the darkness. A sacrifice.
In all my years, I had never seen a reading such as this. Changing quickly, I rushed out into the cold, gossam night, muttering a spell of guidance to lead me to the victims of my vision. If magic were at play, I'd soon find traces of it on the bodies. Jack the Ripper in Gotham. Terror struck the Gotham Opera House last night with the grisly murder of Samuel Archard, son of property tycoon Richard Archard, and Lucy Bonington, a working class immigrant from Ireland reputed to be a lady of the night. God love her. Witnesses claim a shrill scream rang out just past midnight down the Opera House's alleyway. But by the time people had found the location, they discovered the body of a woman in a state of mutilation and the body of a male victim with his throat slit. Quite the scene. Captain James Corrigan, the officer leading the manhunt, speculated that the young archer may have stumbled upon the perpetrator in the midst of his work mutilating Miss Bonington's corpse. Corrigan was quick to denounce the idea that this might be London's infamous serial killer, Jack the Ripper, for fear of spreading panic through the streets of Gotham. Jack the Ripper vanished four years ago in 1888 and his identity still remains a mystery to Scotland Yard. However, the similarities are eerily similar. Samuel Archard, a well-known gambler, often frequented the East End Opera House before making his way to the Belfry for a night of revelry. That's one way to describe it. And if this is the work of London's notorious killer, Mr. Archard would be the first ever confirmed male victim, which would suggest a desperate attempt at escape was made. Jack is known to have killed five women in 1888, with an incredible 13 further victims that fit the profile and time period but which lack enough evidence. However, soon after he began, Jack vanished from the streets of London, leaving only the nightmare of his passage behind him. Gotham has seen its fair share of murders, but this would be her first serial killer, if confirmed. Why has Jack come to London, and how can the police bring this killer to justice when Scotland Yard has had no luck? With heavy police presence expected in East Quarter tonight, many businesses are opting to close early and there are rumours a curfew may come into effect if the killer strikes again. There's also been controversy over Corrigan's appointment as lead investigator. Known as a ruthless lawman, stories continue to surface of protection rackets hidden behind the badge of law. Either way, Gotham PD will be looking to put a quick end to the killing soon and restore calm to the city before panic takes over. By Mallory Drake. Are you fucking kidding me with this tripe? Stories continue to surface of protection rackets. Nebraskas, Simmons, get your lard arses down to the Gotham Gazette and bring me this Mallory Drake for questioning. Just who the hell does he think he is? Straight up slander is what it is. Nebraskas and Simmons pulled themselves out of their chairs. No easy task given their bulk, before waddling off in search of the schmuck about to get his knees capped. Hiding behind the badge, I grumbled to myself, throwing the paper on the floor. Picture of Gotham Opera House stared back at me, haunting with silence. Drake was right about one thing. If they didn't find the killer fast, the city was liable to riot. After the violence this past month, blood was beginning to run through the streets of Gotham. It left a bad taste in the mouth. It was one thing to take a little on the side and keep the palms greased after all, but another to incite chaos and start killing bystanders. That was bad for business. For everyone. 
It had taken me and the boys a while, but we'd knocked that sense back into the gangs before things went too far. Mind you, it had taken a few more scum feeding the chum in Gotham Bay to drum the lesson in first. For a moment I imagined the bodies down there. Floating skeletons of tattered flesh grinning like the devil himself waiting for me. Cold, dark water pouring down my lungs, pushing in all around me. I shivered, casting the old nightmare off. There was work to be done. Felton, grab your coat. Let's see what the morgue has to report. My dearest Alan, I grow weary of a Gotham without you to entertain me. It feels as though years have passed since last we saw one another, not these paltry four months. Keystone City has never felt further away these long days awaiting your return. I spend my time languishing about the house, driving my mother insane, or at the East End Opera House, reveling the night away in the petty hedonism wealth affords me, whilst father grows ever more impatient with me. I suppose it won't be long before he threatens to cut me off again, and puts me to work for him. Without your smile, my days exist empty of color. And without your touch, my nights are long and restless. Father mentioned you casually over breakfast yesterday, having received correspondence from the governor. When I heard the new railway bridge you've been working on was almost complete, I confess my hands all but betrayed their master. I passed the condition off as a consequence of too much revelry the night before to mother. Of course, father all but noticed. If only he knew, the scandal would destroy him, no doubt. But who cares for tired old men and their stubborn ways? You're coming home. At least my heart begins to beat again. Its passion growing with every beat. I'll await you at our favorite spot. With all my love, Sam. I stared at the letter for the hundredth time, my eyes blind to the sea of wooded veils trailing past the carriage window. My train cut through the new Carthage countryside at breathtaking speed. The land awash with the warm orange glow of a quiet sunset. But the beauty of it all felt cheap. A pale imitation of the truth. Only death and pain waited for us behind the shadows of the sun's last embrace. Suddenly, the locomotive's distant rhythmic roar and churning wheels upon the track became a crescendo the moment a carriage door opened. My attention brought sharply back to the gloomy veneer interior. Pools of darkness bled across the carriage, tracing a cobweb of estuaries amidst the dim glow of cheap gas lamps. I made out the small, frail figure of an old Chinaman by the door, a large and obviously heavy leather-bound case in his hands. Eyes kept low, he moved quietly along the carriage until he came to my own seating arrangements. Much of the carriage already full with the tired faces of passengers, he slipped into the seat opposite. A curt nod of his head, the only discerning reference to an awareness of my own pathetic existence. 
He held his case tightly in his arms, and a furtive pair of eyes jumped with every bump upon the track. With one last forlorn look at the letter, I folded it up, slipping the soft paper back into my jacket pocket. For a moment, I couldn't shake the image of Sam's face, his laughter echoing in my ears. And now he was gone. No, not gone. Taken. Murdered. A sudden wave of fatigue weighed down upon me, and I pushed painful thoughts of him from my mind as best I could before settling into a doze. My head arrest a thick, cold glass window. I watched the train roll ever closer to home, to Gotham until at last sleep overcame me. I remember as a child how I could be the lightest of sleepers, awoken by the drip of a tap or scuffling squeaks of a nearby rat. I'd run to my mother and father's bed and shiver beneath their warm embrace for hours before I could sleep again. Of course, as I got older, I gained a modicum of control over the condition. But this time, there was no mistaking the sharp, acritic taste of metal in my mouth as my muscles tightened with a sudden, heightened awareness. My mind awoke with singular sharpness. Lifting the stiff muscles in my neck from the window, I glanced around the dark room the gas lamps all but extinguished. Surely one of the train guards should have been around to reignite the lamps by now. I noticed the Chinaman opposite me had fallen into an uncomfortable sleep, his arms still wrapped tight around the case, head drooped, bobbing with the gentle lull of the train's movements. Something wasn't right. But what was it? Then I heard something, the slightest of noises, a wet gurgling that came and went in an instant. My eyes peered harder into the darkness, eager to discern some modicum of shapes and figures. But they seemed to be deceiving me, for the very shadows themselves were unnatural, pitch and irrevocable. A curtain of darkness crawling through the carriage with quiet, unstoppable malice. 